Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word here tonight, and we ask that you would bless this time, that you would glorify your name, giving us more understanding of the scripture and as we continue on through First Peter. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, obviously, over the, the last couple of sermons, we've seen Peter uh, talk about specific situations, the situation of servant and master in verses 18 through 25 of chapter 2. And then this morning, we saw his counsel to husbands and wives in chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, those passages were addressed to specific contexts and certain scenarios, but we, we definitely saw application broader than just those uh, specific areas. However, in our text tonight, Peter is going to shift his attention more generally to the congregation at large. Now, this marks a transition point in the letter where he's going to address his readers as a whole as to how they should endure persecution. And in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, he, he primarily is going to lay the foundation for how righteous individuals go through periods of suffering. It is important that he addresses this, in, this, this, this admonition not only to individuals, but uh, to the churches. In other words, he doesn't just speak to how we go through persecution individually, uh, but also together as the local church. And this truthfully is one of the most important areas for local churches to, to understand, in my estimation, since the culture is growing increasingly hostile to biblical Christianity and in the hatred for our Lord, we, we need to re-clarify these doctrines. Now, how is it that we can be faithful during difficult periods as a church, and how can we come together throughout these times instead of fracturing apart? Well, let's look at our text here tonight. Read First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We see Peter using the phrase, all of you, evidencing that he is uh, addressing the saints at large here. And the very first aspect he mentions for them is unity of mind, which provides a foundational concept for us to examine, which is my first point here this evening, the centrality of biblical doctrine. In other words, to be unified together biblically means that we are grounded in the truth of Scripture together. Uh, notice how this point plays out here in this text. First of all, the, the quotation from verses 10 through 12, it comes from the 34th Psalm, verses 12 through 16. And notice the emphasis that is placed upon how the, the righteous man pursues that which is good and shuns evil. Verse 9, it says not to repay evil for evil. Verse Verse 10 says we are to keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. Verse 11 says to turn away from evil and do good. Verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And the end of that verse says that his face is against those who do evil. The entire premise running from uh, evil is based upon the reality of God's Word as the sufficient standard. In other words, this is based upon biblical doctrine. Uh, how else are you going to know that which is good from that which is evil? Uh, there is no other true standard than the Word of God. And so the reality of holding fast to the Scripture, it really is undergirding everything within this passage. And so therefore, whenever Peter says here to have unity of mind, that is anchored in a right understanding of scriptural doctrine. Now, how do you as a Christian go through periods of persecution? You must be anchored in the word. You must have a deep understanding of the scripture, which guides all of your path and, and keeps your feet upon that which is righteous. It is the discerning light by which you're able to see the pitfalls of Satan. It enables you to have an ability to discern truth from error. Uh, this must be more 
than a mere commitment that you and I make with our mouths. We must believe the Bible down to the very core of our being. That we must have all of our thinking, all of our life anchored in it. If there is one area where we are not thinking biblically, uh, then that is the chink in the armor through which Satan will powerfully attempt to thrust his dagger. And as we come together in the local body, this commitment to the Lord, this commitment to the Scripture, it plays itself out by bearing the fruit of remarkable unity. True unity in the, uh, in, uh, of mind in the church stems from biblical thinking. Whenever you are living during a period of persecution, there are all kinds of ethical and doctrinal situations which will come to the forefront. For one thing, you're going to have various heretics coming in with their false teachings, trying to get you to compromise. Darkness will creep in to try to pervert the light. That's what it's going to try to do. That is why we cannot be unequally yoked, and we must guard ourselves. For another thing, there is the doctrine of the world that seeks to ridicule you for your faith. They want to scorn you and to shame you for Christianity. As a different situation, you have all of the different ethical challenges and issues around how to deal with persecution, how to stand boldly, and what it means to be faithful to Christ and, and that sort of a situation. And if you and I and everyone else in the church are, are trying to make decisions solely on the basis of our own opinions, then what's going to happen is we're going to be going in a thousand different directions because we all have different ideas. But whenever we lay aside our opinions and we submit to the Word of God, that is when we have unity together. Because if all that we have is a battle of human opinions, then, then at the end of the day, you're just pitting man-made wisdom against itself. That's all that you're consulting. But when we lay that aside and we seek the divine Word of God on the matter, then we see the folly of human wisdom and instead live according to the Scripture. When an individual mistreats one of us, we go to chapter and verse to see how we should handle it. When unjust laws come our way, again, we go to chapter and verse to see how God has commanded us to act. That brings unity. Unity of mind comes from a commitment to apply and to understand the Scripture together. This is the foundational point that Peter wants us to understand here, the foundational point that really underlies everything else. If you're going to stand strong and be unified as a church, then you must be biblical, which produces deeply rooted unity. Point number two, we see the character and necessity of Christian fellowship. You'll notice that in verse 8 here, after giving the command for unity, Peter, he, he goes on to list various traits that he wants us to be marked by. He says, have, he says that we are to have sympathy, first of all. Uh, the King James Version translates this as having compassion for one another, which I think really is a little bit of a better translation summarizing Peter's point here. The church is to be marked by compassion and sympathy which come from Christ. Uh, how could we not be compassionate uh, given the fact that we have been shown such kindness by God himself? Uh, how could we not be compassionate towards our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ whom he has redeemed, knowing the grace and the love shown by God to all of us as his church. The reality of biblical doctrine, it, it should lead to this kind of compassion. We might think that compassion is only something that you would show someone else when they are in deep need, but that's really not the case. It's, it's a trait that we are to always have towards others. It's an attitude that we must continually cultivate, that we're always looking at others for an eye towards how we can help them, how we can benefit them, how we can bless them, and this is especially true amongst the saints. And next we see brotherly love here in the text as well which helps us to understand that Peter is talking about these traits primarily within the local church, within the fellowship of believers. Certainly we should exhibit these things at all times, but, but this emphasis primarily by Peter is placed upon the collective local church, demonstrating these qualities amongst one another. Now the Greek word philadelphos is, is what is used here, which literally means love amongst the brethren. Uh, this word comes from two words, philo. 
Adelphos, which means a dear friend, and the word Adelphos, which means brother. And taken together, they mean to express love to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a pure love which comes from Christ because he is pure. It is also a deep love because Christ loves us deeply and profoundly. And in fact, the Christian love for each other, it's so deep that our calling is to love as Christ himself has loved. The Lord made this clear in John 13, 34 through 35. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The calling here is to pattern our lives and our love after the love of the Lord. This is actually one of the clearest testimonies to the lost, that they, they, they see that we have a deep, sound, biblical love for one another for the glory of Christ. Uh, this is something that the churches really have to focus. That they have to lock in on maintaining. It's easy for all of us to allow the, the busyness of life to distract us from the fellowship of the church. Uh, that we can become preoccupied with other activities which in the end don't, don't really matter. Our love and our commitment can grow cold and that is why we must focus on the command given in scripture here. In other words, this is something that we're going to have to intentionally pursue and strive after. Meeting with other believers throughout the week, buying their lunch, coming to church fellowship, coming to stay late after a service or coming early to try to encourage others. These, these are all simple activities that, that we can do to love one another. But the idea is that we do life together, unified together through the good times and the bad times, one anothering in Christ. And I want you to notice the next, next aspect here. Peter mentions in verse 8, he says that we must have a tender heart. Uh, the King James Version translates this as be pitiful, which I think is a bit humorous because in, in our modern day language, that sounds like we're supposed to be pathetic or something along those lines. Uh, but the idea being communicated, it's, it's not anything like that. Rather to be sympathetic or pitiful towards another in a sense of showing great kindness to them. A heart should not be hard to those who are in need, but kind and generous. The, the local church should be a place marked for its giving. Obviously, we're wise, not giving in a way that seeks to enable others towards their sin. It would be unwise for us to give a thousand dollars in hard in hard cash to someone who we know is a drug addict. We might help them in another way by purchasing food or something along those lines, but the local church should exercise wisdom in these areas. Yet in saying that, the church should be known for liberal generosity and giving. Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so Paul says that it is very, it is very good for us to be kind, to do good towards all men, and particularly an emphasis in the local church is what we see here because we are united in Christ. Uh, this heart, it, it takes cultivation to be tender towards others, that you must seek to be aware of the individual's greatest need, of their real deep need when you're trying to help them. Uh, the person in the pew beside you, hopefully, is a sound biblical Christian, in which case they do not need salvation because they already have it in Christ. But if we're giving towards those outside of the church, seeking to help their needs, then the gospel should be at play in the center of it all uh, because they need to know Christ. That is their greatest need. And so we, we can't neglect that while we're also trying to help their physical needs. In the early days of this country, many churches would actually seek to help legal immigrants who came over here by teaching them the English language. Their, these immigrants, their children, would go to the, the Christian school. The parents would be taught by Christians in the church, seeking to help, help them learn the, the skills that they needed to understand and, and to be actively using in order to survive in the new world. And these churches would also share the gospel with them, teaching them Christian theology. And that's a good example of a church seeking to meet the physical needs of others and also meet their greatest need, which is the need of their soul, the need for the gospel. 
But if the church isn't willing to help those within its own walls, it will certainly never have a passion for helping those outside in terms of their physical needs or their eternal needs. And so Peter here is urging us to develop a tender heart, a heart that is, is prone to want to help others, to invest in them, to give of them of our time and our money and our talents in other areas. And Jesus Christ has been tender-hearted towards us, has been kind, has been merciful. And so we should seek to have a heart that attentively looks for how we can bring, bring blessing to those around us, especially amongst the church. Now look at the last quality here in verse 8. Peter says that we are to have a humble mind. Other translations will give this portion of the verse as saying, Be courteous. Humble individuals are some of the most courteous in the sense that they are considerate. They are kind towards others. That is because they understand that the world is not revolving on its axis around them as the center. In contrast to the prideful individual who thinks that they are the center of the universe, the humble person considers their own needs last of all. It's more important for them to be flexible, to help others, to bless others, than to put themselves first. They're not interested in promoting their own prideful agendas. They're not interested in ensuring that they are the center of attention. They simply serve out of a humble heart. This is another quality which should be present in the local church, which should mark local congregations. A prideful congregation will be resistant to the Scripture. Uh, they will be constantly biting at one another. Why is that? Because in a church full of pride, each, each person is focusing on me, myself, and I. Well, why, why didn't you ask me to sing instead of them? Why didn't you say my hand first instead of his hand? Now, how come I didn't get to go first in line at the fellowship? It's always about I, 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 I. The opposite of this is to be someone who constantly pursues the glory and the pleasure of God and the good of others, who is so consumed in honoring Christ and serving others that there is no place for pride. The local church should be a place of humility because we realize that we are absolutely nothing in comparison to God himself. And we are mere creatures. We, we are dust who rebelled against the one who breathed life into us. Yet God redeemed us, and so we should have a joyful humility in our lives. All of these character qualities should be dominant. They should be dominant in the life of every believer. They should be dominant in the church, and we grow in them, realizing the glory of our God, the truth of His Word, and intentionally pursuing these areas by the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't become unified as a church any other way than the consistent study of the Scripture. You don't grow to have love or sympathy or tenderheartedness other than by looking at the way Christ himself demonstrated these qualities, lived out these qualities, and then earnestly patterning yourself after him. It takes effort by the sanctifying power of the Spirit in order to have each one of them in your life. And you pursue humility more by knowing more of God so that you live your life theocentrically, meaning God-centered. The problem with prideful individuals is that they don't have an accurate understanding of God. If they did, there is no way that they can be prideful. In this text, we see the character we are called to have. But if you'll notice, we also see the necessity of gathering together. Peter says to pursue unity of mind. If you're going to be united, then the idea is that you have to be seeing each other regularly. He says to exercise brotherly love. Again, if you're going to love someone like a brother, then it would be a logical deduction that you're going to have to spend time with them. Right, the church is vital to the spiritual growth. It is vital to the maturity of the believer. There is no type of Christianity where the church and the fellowship of the saints is not pivotal. Peter goes forward in verse 9. Verse 9, where we see the start of our third point, which is the blessing of obedience to God. He says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you recall that you may obtain a blessing. This is truly the heart of a humble and a loving person. 
It is as though Peter sees the sinful tendencies of our heart and speaks against them. Uh, that when we undergo evil, our response is to not give evil back, but to bless. The context here clearly is persecution. That's the dominant theme of First Peter as a whole. And so the apostle, he's not outlying instances like self-defense here. Jesus sent his followers out with swords in Luke twenty two thirty six. Christ himself overturned the tables in the temple. My point is that Christianity, Peter is not advocating for a religion of pacifists who do not defend those around them when evil arises. Self-defense is completely justified biblically. You can read a text like Exodus 22, 1 through 4 for an explanation of that fact. However, in saying all of that, when someone comes against you for your faith and persecutes you, you don't return that for evil by sinning. There is a time to go to prison and to suffer for the sake of Christ. It takes biblical wisdom to discern whether it's a situation where we go to prison or it's a situation where we engage in self-defense in other scenarios. When someone insults you personally, when they take out anger against you, do not follow the same course. Instead, you seek blessing for the person, pray for their salvation, Or if it is an immature believer who somehow has offended you, pray for their spiritual growth in Christ. The idea that Peter is communicating is that we do not return sin for sin, but we return the sin of the unbeliever by being faithful to the Lord, through blessing them, through seeking what is good for them. I don't think I have to tell you that this takes a heart of humility. This is going to take an eternal focus and and an understanding of how much you and I have been forgiven by the Lord. But notice that Peter says, this is our calling in the middle of verse 9. It is given to us by the Lord who wants us to have this demeanor. He wants us to act this way. Then at the end of verse 9, it is said that we are given this calling that you may obtain a blessing. A spiritual blessing that you know that you are doing that which is good before God. That if, you're, if, if you sin because someone mistreats you, then you've only brought misery upon your own soul. You have done that which is evil before God, and you're guilty for it. However, if you, if you bless those who persecute you, then you've acting, acted in a pleasing way before God. Your soul, it overflows with joy because you know the reality that you are walking in His holy paths. The forgiven soul is a forgiving soul, and it is a free soul because of the grace of God. Those who repay evil for evil are the ones who who are enslaved by their sin. They think they're getting revenge. They think that that revenge is going to taste sweet. But all they are doing is placing the shackles of slavery to their sin tighter upon their wrists because it just enslaves them. Now Peter turns at this point to quote Psalm 32. To expand on the blessing of the Christian life, look at verses 10 through 12. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The truly well-lived life is the life lived for the glory of God according to the commandments of God. It is, important, it is very important that Peter emphasizes this to these Christians going through suffering. Think about it for a second. If you're being targeted for your faith, the temptation is to back away and to choose a different course. You might think, hey, I, I might not really be living the best way because you're encountering so much difficulty. Maybe you should hit the reset button and choose something different. Peter says no. Peter says you are living the best way. That it is no good use of your life to indulge in the sins and the evil ways of the world. Nor is it good to cave into the world so that they will quit persecuting you. The best use of your life is to fix your gaze upon God. To fix your gaze upon Christ and to live according to His word. The American patriot and Soldier Nathan Hill once spoke these words before being hanged by the British. He said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Those words inspired American soldiers during the war for independence. And I suppose Americans ever since he said them. Could you say that if you had 1,000 lives to live, the best way to spend them all would be in service to the Lord Jesus Christ? That it would not only be evil for you to use them for sin, 
but it would also be the path of least joy for you to use them for sin instead of being Christ's servant. If you desire to love life, if you desire to see good and to follow uh, God, then be obedient to Christ. Do not give in to that which is evil. That is what Peter says. He says, keep your tongue and your lips from sin, from evil, and speaking deceit in verse 10. Don't gossip, don't slander, or engage in lying and evil talk. Those things are disruptive. They are opposed to God. They violate His commandments. Guard your mouth so that it might not be used for Satan's schemes, but to bring honor to the Lord. Verse 11 says we are to simply turn or to shun evil, seeking to do good, seeking to pursue peace. And then verse 12 reminds us why these actions bring about such a profound joy. It is because God sees all. He sees us. He hears our prayers. God is for those who are in Christ, acting righteously according to His will. But He is against the wicked. He is against the evildoers. He is against sinners. The best life is one spent for Christ because Christ sees all, knows all, and will judge all. And He will reward you for that life and service by His grace, by His mercy. That is what Peter reminds the believers of during suffering. Yeah, this is meant to inflame their souls, that in, in spite of all of the opposition that they are facing, that they need to stand strong. They need to have a firm passion for Christ, seeking to live for His sake. I pray that we also will see these truths and embody them well for the glory of God and the honor of Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer here tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study this text, for the opportunity to, to understand these marks of, of the local church, the importance of the fellowship of the local church, what undergirds the unity of the local church, and how we live during times of difficulty, during times of suffering and strife how we live to be faithful to you in those times and indeed in all times. And I ask that you would help us to be faithful individually, that all of us would seek to grow in you, that we would be increasingly sanctified by you, living in obedience to your commandments, and also that you would continue to grow us as a local church, that we would increasingly be conformed to your holy word, seeking your glory, being a God-centered church for the honor of your name. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus I pray. Amen.